Chapter 8 considers physical and cognitive development in adolescence. We all know that adolescence is a time of great change. We'll take a look at significant developmental changes that involve important psychological challenges as well. This particular chapter carefully examines the rites of passage from adolescence to young adulthood. It looks at the factors that accompany the transition, including pubertal changes, health and nutrition, and changes in information processing. Obesity, anorexia, and bulimia are also discussed, as well as the effectiveness of obesity prevention programs and the discussion on eating disorders in young men. The second half of the chapter focuses on reasoning about moral issues. Kohlberg's theory of moral development is examined as well as ways to promote moral reasoning. This chapter also includes new material on participation in religious activities as an influence on moral reasoning. Researchers have found that moral reasoning in adolescence can be linked successfully with many of the moral issues of adulthood to be introduced in later chapters and include marriage, divorce, remarriage, work and family dilemmas, occupational challenges, and the care of aging family members, including death and dying. You know, this chapter lays the foundation for chapter nine, where students will take a look at the opportunity to explore whether adolescence is a time of storm and stress or whether storm and stress is actually a myth. So to begin, let's take a look at pubertal changes. Of course, signs of physical maturation include a number of bodily changes that occur. It includes a period of rapid growth. Two general types of physical changes mark the transition from childhood to adulthood. There are physical as well as sexual maturation. Bear in mind that body parts don't mature at the same time. The head, hands, and feet usually begin to grow first. The trunk and shoulders are the last to grow. Of course, there are gender differences. Body fat increases more readily or rapidly in girls. Heart and lung capacity increases more in boys. At the beginning of adolescence, the brain is nearly its full size. There are two features of brain development that are nearly complete in adolescence. Myelination is the acquisition of fatty insulation that makes neurons transmit information faster. Synaptic pruning, the weeding out of unnecessary connections between neurons also takes place. Also remember that not all brain regions reach maturity at the same time. Brain systems that are sensitive to reward reach maturity earlier. Brain systems responsible for self-control aren't fully specialized until adulthood. Now, sexual maturation occurs in a predictable sequence and includes two key changes. Primary sex characteristics, which refers to the organs directly involved in reproduction. Secondary sex characteristics are physical signs of maturity not directly linked to the re re reproductive organs. For girls, puberty begins with growth of the breasts, a growth spurt in the menarche, which is the onset of menstruation, typically occurring somewhere around age 13. For boys, puberty usually commences with the growth of the testes and scrotum, followed by the appearance of pubic hair, the start of the growth spurt and growth of the penis. Around 13 years of age, most boys reach what's called a sperm arch, or the first spontaneous ejaculation of sperm-laden fluid. Now, the pituitary gland regulates pubertal changes by signaling other glands to secrete hormones. The pituitary gland signals the adrenal glands to reduce to release androgens. It also signals the ovaries to release estrogen. The pituitary gland also signals the testes to release the androgen hormone testosterone. Please remember that the timing of pubertal events is typically regulated by the genetic factors related to those children. Now, genetic forces are strongly influenced by the environment, particularly in adolescence, nutrition, and health. Menage occurs earlier in areas, of, in areas where the nutrition and health care systems are adequate. Genetic influence is also shown by the fact that a mother's age at Menarche is related to her daughter's age at Menarche. Social environment influences are also significant as they deal with puberty. Menarche occurs in younger ages in girls who experience chronic stress or depression. What about some of the psychological impacts on puberty? 
What about the ideas related to body image? Adolescents are much more concerned about their overall appearance. Generally, girls will worry, worry more than boys about appearance and are more likely to be dissatisfied with their appearance. Boys tend to be unhappy with their appearance when they expect to have an idealized, strong, muscular body, but of course don't. Responses to the menarche and the sperm arch are also different. Girls usually tell their mothers first and tell their friends after two or three menstrual periods. Menarche is usually a private occasion for adolescent girls living in industrialized countries, but it's often celebrated in other traditional cultures. In contrast to the menarche, much less is known about boys' reaction to the sperm arch. Boys can feel more positively about it, but boys rarely tell parents or friends about this new development. Adolescents are also thought to be extremely moody. Evidence indicates that they're moodier than children or adults. Mood shifts are often more associated with changes in activities and social settings. Teens tend to be more likely to report being in a good mood with friends or when recreating and a bad mood when the adult re regulated settings set in. Puberty begins at roughly age 10 in the average girl and age 12 in the average boy. An early maturing boy might begin puberty at age 11 or so, while a late maturing boy might not start until age 15 or 16. As early maturing girl might start her puberty at age 9 or so, while a late maturing girl might not start until 14 or 15. Maturing early or late has its own psychological consequences that differ between boys and girls. Girls who mature early often lack self-esteem and appear to be less popular. They also lack confidence and tend to be a little bit more depressed and have behavioral concerns. They're also more likely to smoke and drink. Early maturation can have life-changing effects and early maturing girls who are pressured into sex earlier tend to become mothers while still teenagers. These harmful outcomes are more likely when living in poverty or experiencing harsh punishment from parents. Boys who mature early are at a risk for depression. They're more prone to substance abuse and are more prone to participate in early sexual activity. Now, from a health perspective, a number of changes occur in adolescence. Puberty brings special nutritional needs, including hemoglobin for increased muscle mass, as well as menstruation, iron, and calcium. Without adequate iron, teens are often listless and moody. Without adequate calcium, bones may not fully develop, placing them at risk later in life for osteoporosis. Now, the technical definition for being overweight is based on the body mass index, or the BMI, which is an adjusted ratio of weight to height. Children and adolescents who are in the upper 5% of their BMI are defined as being overweight. The U.S. Surgeon General announced in 2001 that childhood obesity has reached epidemic proportions. One child or adolescent out of every seven is overweight. Overweight children and adolescents are also often unpopular. They have low self-esteem and are at risk for medical concerns. Environment is also as important as heredity when it comes to juvenile obesity. TV advertising and parents play a role. Parents may inadvertently encourage obesity by emphasizing external eating signals rather than internal cues such as the feelings of hunger. Too little sleep can also lead to weight gain. The focus of programming for treating obesity focuses on the change of eating habits, encouraging activity and discouraging sedentary behavior. Children learn to monitor their eating, exercise and sedentary behavior. Parents are trained to help children set realistic eating goals and use behavioral principles to help children meet those goals. Eating disorders are another problem common in adolescents. Anorexia nervosa, for example, is a disorder marked by the persistent refusal to eat and an irrational fear of being overweight. Individuals with anorexia nervosa have a grossly distorted image of their own body and claim to be overweight despite being, painful, despite being painfully thin. This is a very serious disorder and it can lead to death if left untreated. Bulimia nervosa involves alternating between binge eating periods and purging through self-induced vomiting 
or with the use of laxatives or even excessive exercise. During binge eating, adolescents with bulimia will consume two days worth of food calories in two hours or less, at least on the average. Then they purge once or twice daily. Several factors contribute to both disorders, the first of which is heredity. There are a number of psychological, I'm sorry, psychosocial factors as well, including adverse life expectations, negative self-esteem or mood or anxiety disorders, being overly concerned about one's body and weight and dieting, internalizing the thin body that is often thought to be the ideal in Western cultures. Surprisingly, boys make up about 10% of those individuals diagnosed with eating concerns. Distorted body image about not being sufficiently muscular can be problematic. Programs can help protect teens from eating disorders. The best programs are interactive and they tend to work to change critical attitudes and provide ways to resist social pressure to be thin. We all know that individuals who engage in physical activity regularly reduce their risk for many health problems. Most adolescents do not get enough exercise, but many teenagers engage in organized sports, which can enhance self-esteem, provide an opportunity to learn social skills and learn initiative. Sports can also lead to injuries, which of course is a drawback. The use of performance enhancing drugs can be problematic and antisocial behavior as well. Every year, approximately one adolescent out of every 2,000 dies, usually from an accident. The pattern of death depends on gender and ethnicity. The most common cause of death is motor vehicular accidents with boys and girls or firearms when it comes to young men. The next most common cause of death for boys and girls is suicide. Of course, many of these deaths are preventable. Deaths and automobile accidents are often linked to driving too fast, texting while driving, the consumption of alcohol, or not wearing seat belts. Deaths due to guns are often linked to all too easy access to firearms in the home. Many adolescents take risks that adults find unacceptable. <clears throat> they drive recklessly, they engage in unprotected sex, and sometimes use illegal and dangerous drugs. Adolescents vastly overestimate their invulnerability. Adolescents are more likely to engage in high risk behaviors because they find the rewards associated with those risky behaviors far more appealing than adults do. The pleasure, excitement, and intimacy of sex far outweigh the risks of disease and pregnancy. Now, information processing also changes during adolescence. For information processing theorists, Adolescence does not represent a distinct, qualitatively different stage of cognitive development. Adolescents' working memory has about the same capacity as adults' working memory. The change in working memory and processing speed that occurs in childhood means that adolescents process information more efficiently. Increased myelination during adolescence allows nerve impulses to follow or to travel more rapidly. Adolescents also acquire adult-like levels of knowledge and understanding, which has an indirect effect on cognitive processing, enabling adolescents to learn, understand, and remember more and new experiences. As their content knowledge increases, adolescents become much better skilled at identifying strategies appropriate for specific tasks. Adolescents often solve problems more readily than children and do so in more of an analytical fashion. They have better formal operational thinking skills and greater memory capacity than children. Adolescents also have more sophisticated approaches to reasoning and problem solving and are better skilled at finding weaknesses in arguments. Adolescents also use their thinking skills selectively, more when their beliefs are threatened and less when their beliefs are supported. And there's always the wonderful subject of morality. Lawrence Kohlberg developed a theory of moral reasoning based on how children, adolescents, and adults respond to a large number of moral dilemmas. Now, Kohlberg identified three levels of moral reasoning. Each one of those is divided into two stages. The pre-conventional stage is the lower level, and at this level, moral reasoning is based on external forces. Now, the first stage of the pre-conventional model includes obedience orientation, obedience to authority, 
includes most exclusively controlled by rewards and punishment. Stage one individuals do what authorities say is right to avoid being punished. It also includes instrumental orientation. That's when people look out for their own needs. People are nice to others because they expect the favor to be returned in the future. The conventional level comes after the pre-conventional level, of course. It includes adolescents and adults who look to society's norms for moral guidance. The interpersonal norms include moral reasoning based on winning the approval of others. In social system morality, adolescents and adults believe that social roles, expectations, and laws exist to maintain order within a society and to promote the good of all people. And lastly, the post-conventional level, moral reasoning, tends to be based on a personal moral code. Emphasis is no longer on external cues. The social contract suggests that moral reasoning is based on the belief that laws are for the good of all members of society. And a universal ethical principle is, considers abstract principles such as justice, compassion, and equality to form the basis of a personal code that may sometimes conflict with what society's expectations and laws do. Now there's a bunch of support for Kohlberg's theory. Individuals move through the six stages in the order listed and not only in that order. Support for Kohlberg's invariant sequence of stages comes from longitudinal studies measuring individuals' level of reasoning over several years. There's also additional support for Kohlberg's theory that comes from research on the link between moral reasoning and moral behavior. Of course, if there's some sort of support, there's certainly bound to be some limitations to Kohlberg's theory. For example, moral reasoning is not as consistent as would be expected from a theory. Another concern is Kohlberg's claim that his sequence of stages is universal, meaning that it happens in all cultures and with all people. Moral reasoning in other cultures is often not described well by Kohlberg's theory. Some other cultural differences in moral reasoning, bear in mind that not all cultures and religions share the emphasis on individual rights and justice reflected traditionally in the American culture. Even research on Western cultures does not consistently support the theory that emphasizes justice. And the theory does not factor in the impact of membership in other social groups. But when it comes to promoting the idea of social and moral reasoning, it's important to have exposure to more advanced moral reasoning through observations of others' thinking and discussion of moral issues with peers, teachers, and parents helping adolescents to reevaluate their thinking and become more sophisticated. Involvement in religious influences also impacts moral reasoning through specific religious values, as well as involvement in a larger community. Adolescents who are free to express their own opinions and discuss moral issues with their parents will often have more mature moral reasoning. There's a lot to uncover in this particular chapter as it relates to adolescent development. If I can provide you with any other information, please don't hesitate to let me know.